thank you very much indeed for joining the, the webinar. I'm sure it's a, a different time of day uh, wherever you are and uh, takes some commitment on a Saturday to come and join us. So uh, big thanks once again. I'm going to let uh, everyone in introduce themselves very briefly. Uh, we've got um, Dr. David Howard, Dr. Matthew Hardy and Julia Conte in the room. And I just would like you to turn on your microphones and maybe just give us a couple of lines about yourself to introduce. Fly far away first. No, so, away hello, first. hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us uh, on, a, on a well, it's a sunny Saturday here in in, in the UK. Uh, my name is David Howard. I'm a director of the Sustainable Urban Development Program at University of Oxford, um, and I am also a co-director of the Global Centre on Healthcare and Urbanisation at Kellogg College, Oxford. So I. Um, helped uh, deliver a program for master's students and DEFL students and it's great to see Celine here who's an alumna of the master's program in sustainable urban development and um, uh, really the aim of this uh, this week or this, this a studio in Venice is to try and instill some of the ideas we teach in Oxford around the sustainable urban development program into the context of, of Venice so um, that's the aim and over to Matthew probably. Hello everyone from a sunny Saturday afternoon in London um, I'm Matthew Hardy, I'm Senior Lecturer in Architecture and Urbanism at the Princess Foundation and a Senior Associate Tutor at the Department for Continuing Education, University of Oxford, and also um, founder and editor, or co-editor of Journal of Urbanism, International uh, Research on uh, Placemaking and Urban Sustainability. Great. And Julia, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, hi. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us in our webinar. I am Julia Conte. I'm joining you from Venice, uh, and I am the program manager of the European Cultural Academy, so I am responsible for the organization of the courses in Venice. Thank you, Julia. So um, I'm Alan Rogers. I'm the University Collaborations Manager for the European Cultural Academy, and I'm going to do a brief introduction to the webinar uh, in uh, a couple of minutes. Um, I asked myself two questions. Uh, why would I want to study sustainability, sustainability in, uh, in Venice? Why particularly in Venice? And why would I want to study with the European Cultural Academy? So I'm just gonna do a very brief uh, presentation, share my screen with you, and it uh, should be about five minutes, and then I'll hand over to the experts, uh, and in particular to Matthew, okay? So I'm just sharing a screen now with you. That's great. And you should be able to see this on your screen. So why study sustainability in Venice? Well, here was a really great reason. Uh, about 10 days ago, Venice announced that it is candidating itself to become the world capital of environmental sustainability, which uh, is a fantastic thing. And obviously, it's in competition with other cities who will want to uh, also have this crown. But uh, for me, one of the great things about the European green city or the city of culture or the, 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 the Olympic cities is that it, it signals an intention by the city council, by the region, by Italy itself to start work on some really great projects. And they've identified hydrogen, energy transition, social inclusion, housing and tourism. So that work is uh, due to start and uh, Venice will be a better place for it. At the moment, if you're a tourist in Venice, you, you may be thinking about this really as when, when someone asks you what Venice is like, you might be thinking about a crowded St. Mark's Square on Carnival Day. You may be thinking about Aqua Alta, the high water that sometimes floods the city and means you have to parade the streets in Wellington boots. And when it gets really high, shifts ferries from the, uh, from the canal onto the banks. You may be thinking about the fact that Venice is quite a labyrinthine, uh, narrow, difficult city to, to negotiate. Lots of people get lost here. Or you may be thinking about the mass tourism and the cruise ships which come into town and dwarf the architecture. Um, what's interesting about that is that uh, you do, you do realise 
when the cruise ship passes that the architecture in Venice is very human scale uh, because the cruise ships definitely aren't. Little, little known facts are things like there are 10 million upturned petrified trees that support the foundation of the city. Uh, taken from the forest, from the mountains, at a time when deforestation wasn't even uh, an issue, you know, we're talking about five, six, seven hundred years ago. Because these upturned trees are sunk into the mud and the mud doesn't have air in it, they, they turn into a kind of a stone. So there's kind of two sides to this argument because there's no cement either in Venice, there's no cement in the, in the foundations, no armour. Uh, it's it's basically trees and rafts of trees at the very base. You may uh, be thinking about the fact that Venice is built on salt water, and uh, and therefore you can't drill down to to draw draw up the water for drinking. And there's a very sophisticated, uh, very sophisticated water filtration system, uh, which is quite ancient where rainwater is gathered from the roofs and then filtered through sand in the courtyards uh, and becomes part of the drinking water in the well. You may be thinking about the fact that there's no cars or no trains, no heavy industry, so uh, no pollution, question mark. There's all kinds of different boats and there's obviously walking. There's very, very green ecological ways of getting around by rowing or sailing. There are public and private transport. In, in terms of the boat, the boat uh, use. There's also teenagers that burn huge amounts of diesel driving around the, the lagoon at great speeds and causing distress because of the high waves that they, they, they create. You may not know that the city of Venice is 118 islands, uh, each, each with a church and a canal and uh, connected by 400 bridges. And you can see in the in the illustration in the bottom uh, right hand corner that it, originally they were quite organic islands and they become structured over the years as an act of collective architecture, as well as having real gems of architectural genius uh, amongst them. The flood defence systems have been operating now for a couple of years, and since they've been operating properly, uh, there hasn't been high water in Venice. But this is a big ecological experiment, and uh, there are lots of protests about what that might do to the to the in the structure of the lagoon itself. That's a. That's a um, Someone has the mic on. If 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 you'd like to mute the mic, it would be great. Thank you. Um, or is it just pure romance and magic? Is that is that how you feel about Venice? But it certainly has the aspect. But all those other things contribute to the magic and the romance. So if you come and study at the European Cultural Academy, you'll be part of that uh, history, part of that. Um, that, that kind of intertwining of social and private structures. Our headquarters are in Palazzo Michel, which is on the top uh, left of your um, screen. That's where the classes will take place, where the lectures will take place. In the middle is Palazzo Mora, which is the European Cultural Centre's uh, exhibition uh, venue. And the exhibitions are on all the way through the Biennale and we have access to the exhibitions and sometimes to the artists there. Palazzo Bembo is on the Grand Canal, which we use occasionally also for, for classes. These are patrician palaces and uh, from noble families that produced eight do doges between them. We also have the use of uh, two gardens on the, on the basin of St. Mark's. Uh, the gardens are called Marina Ressa and uh, they're there also for projects which can uh, have an outdoor element. That's a, a bridge uh, prototype by Zaha Hadid. These two people are important. The, the Biennale director this year is Cecilia Alemani, and uh, next year there is the Architecture Biennale, and that's curated by Leslie Loco. Um, not the first time we've had women curators, certainly the first time we've had an Italian curator for the, for the Art Biennale. 
these are also things that are in Venice, actually physically in Venice, that we can use, visit uh, whilst we're whilst we're studying in Venice. The only thing that's not in Venice is the Anish Kapoor, but I put that in because he's opening a foundation in Venice this year. So there will be access also to the Anish Kapoor Foundation as well. On the bottom row, there's the architecture from fishing huts through, through Byzantine, Gothic, Baroque, Palladio, Art Deco, all the way through to Carlo Scarpa. All those are in Venice and you can see them while you're studying with us. These are some of the experiences from the students. We like to have uh, interaction between students and uh, and peer-to-peer -peer learning, presentations, uh, active sessions out in the town, drawing, visits to museums, visits to, to galleries, visits to artists, visits to practicing architects. So all those are part of the course. And here are the course details. I just stay on this slide a second. Um, the course will take place uh, in uh, late June and early July this year. Course fee is uh, 1,650 euros. The language will be in English and the location will be in Palazzo Michel, but also outside in locations across Venice. And there's a list of what you might get for your investment, tuition with course leaders, visiting lecturers, self-directed study time, professional portfolio development, which is very important for us that you leave Venice with uh, that extra something in your portfolio that you can use for job interviews and uh, et cetera. Assessment feedback, a chance to work with international students. This is an open course that we're running uh, with Oxford and the Princess Foundation. So there will be students from other places, which is always good. There's a fully equipped studio in the Venetian Palace, and that's the palace on, on the, the right hand side there. And uh, guided visits to Biennale, other museums, visits to European Cultural Center exhibitions, social evenings, catalogues, goodie bags, etc. That's what's included inside the course fee, not included the flights, accommodation and food. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions about that later, uh, but I really want to move on to, to bring in uh, Dr. Matthew Hardy now. So um, I'm just going to finish with this, which is my details. And you can get in touch after uh, if we don't manage to get through to your question in, in the chat later. But uh, I'm here and I'm taking questions at any time by email. Okay, so I'm going to stop the share there. And if Matthew could come in for me. Thank you, Alan. Um, and thank That's you for that introduction. And um, I've had a request uh, by through the chat to um, speak slowly. So I shall attempt to do that um, so that those who are not native English speakers will have a better chance to understand. So um, the theme of our, um, of our summer school is sustainable, healthy cities. And by this, we don't only mean um, in the context of the recent pandemic, but rather to cast the net more widely uh, and think about what cities uh, have to do to face the future and, and what are the challenges that cities face for the future. So if we think of um, the future of, um, as we all know, uh, a, a, a majority of the world's population living in cities and in, um, in cities uh, uh, around the world, and the, the, the largest volume of construction of those cities being in the global south, um, we face significant challenges, I think, um, in, in making sustainable, healthy cities. And just to name a, a handful of those challenges, pollution, um, creating a circular economy, um, uh, uh, building cities which provide ecosystem services to their inhabitants. And I'll come back on a little bit of detail on all of these. Decarbonizing transport, a challenge which um, has barely been attempted, uh, let alone achieved. Um, the challenge to meet uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming. Challenge of... Uh, of making a healthy and um, uh, and satisfying and uh, and um, you know uh, uh, productive populations. Um, and I want to come 
back to each of those in, in detail. We know of the pollution problems that we face, um, they, they tend to differ around the world, uh, the developing world faces what's called the, the, brown, um, the brown challenges of uh, uh, sewage, uh, um, uh, paving and rubbish and so on. The developed world more uh, uh, what we call gray and um, problems of air quality uh, and, and water. Uh, and uh, the, the advanced economies, uh, what are called green and blue problems of, um, of nature in the city and and um, and uh, um, and managing um, surface water runoff. Um, the circular economy um, in which we no longer have a linear system of extracting resources, processing them, turning them into consumer goods, consuming them, throwing them away and burying them or burning them as waste. We have to make our waste into our um, resources stream. And the most of that has to happen in cities. So how do we do that? And lastly, of those three big challenges, ecosystem services. How do we make cities which are, are accommodating nature and in which we are actually able to improve natural habitats through stewardship. A really major challenge for, uh, for cities. We know that in many countries of the world, um, cities are already more biodiverse than the countryside, the agricultural countryside that surrounds them. Very often industrialized agriculture using a lot of pesticides and, and, um, and mechanization, um, which is not as biodiverse as an urban garden. But how do we treat the rain that falls on cities? And one of the, the classic um, effects that we predict or that scientists predict for cities is heavier rainfall. How do we make cities which are currently hard paved and which discharge lots of very dirty water into the waterways in the sea? How do we make them retain and filter and, and, and nurture that water, creating biodiversity and providing uh, uh, habitats for, for fish and birds and and other creatures within the city. In terms of decarbonisation of transport, a challenge which has barely been attempted. Indeed, most of the indicators are, are, are in the wrong direction. In Britain, we've been very much self-congratulatory about the progress we've made on decarbonising electricity generation, but we've made almost no progress on decarbonising transport. Indeed, we continue to build roads for a future which we imagine will be dominated by motor vehicles, individual motor vehicles, perhaps electric rather than internal combustion engines, but still providing the same problems of you know, utilization of space, uh, um, of scarce resources, creating uh, dust and air pollution through brakes and, uh, and, uh, um, and uh, the abrasion of tires on the road, if not through exhaust tailpipe emissions. The challenge to, to keep global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, an immense challenge in which every part of our current economic system and every part of our cities needs to be reconfigured and adapted so that we have a habitable world to live in beyond, um, beyond the present day. Um, how do we make um, cities support healthy populations? How do we uh, support um, uh, active and healthy and um, safe uh, um, lives for people in cities? How can we uh, uh, move to more of a, 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 a concentration on active travel, which has so many benefits for the future? These are the sorts of challenges that we hope that you will be addressing in our, in our summer school together. And I should say, we don't think of, uh, in these summer schools, we don't think of of, uh, of teachers and students, but of participants, because everyone who takes part in a summer school, in my opinion, brings expertise from their part of the world, from their, um, from their knowledge, from their skills, from their understanding, from their experience of life, and shares it together in a big melting pot. And we hope that the, um, uh, the interaction between people from around the world and with a range of skills and abilities uh, helps everyone um, to uh, produce uh, 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 um, results and, and products from the summer school, which are the best that can possibly be achieved for them. And so I always see summer schools as a form of exchange between um, 
between participants in which um, the learning is as much from each other as it is from, from those who we're bringing in as guest lecturers. So onto the summer school in a little more detail. And we have a program uh, which will be made public shortly, but it's based around four themes. Uh, and these relate to the challenges that, that sustainable healthy cities face, which are um, uh, the themes are, I should say, soft mobility and active travel, so addressing the uh, problem of decarbonizing transport, food and urbanism. And we'd be very pleased to have a guest lecturer um, and, and participant, um, Professor Susan Parham, who's written on um, food and urbanism for, I think, uh, 25 years, on uh, the morphology of sustainable settlements. How do we actually create sustainable settlements? What will they look like? How will they occupy the ground? How will they uh, uh, be connected together? You know, often these challenges and the solutions to them are discussed too much in the abstract. And we really want to uh, think about the actual um, the challenge of, of actualizing and concretizing um, the form of sustainable settlements. And finally, how can we use natural materials which are themselves low carbon and which produce um, buildings with a long life and a low carbon footprint? Uh, we know that uh, 40 to 60% of the energy of a building in its life is in the materials, the embodied, so-called embodied carbon, rather than the carbon produced in use. So how are we going to build with materials which we can't take for granted? We, we can't simply go on using concrete and steel which have enormous carbon footprints what what else are we going to use indeed i've been at a conference this week that was looking at exactly that challenge and it's quite a challenge so why venice and ellen has hinted at, at why venice and i think well you could go back to um, le corbusier who described venice in the 1920s as the only possible city of the future. And one of the reasons he saw it as, as that was the rigorous separation of modes between motorized transport on the canals and, and active travel and the um, Calais and, and the Rio Terras, walking and, um, and mechanized transport completely separate. And uh, although I wouldn't necessarily agree with his proposals for achieving that segregation of modes, I think that is the way that we need to proceed to make active travel accessible for everyone. Um, and what I, how will we deliver this summer school? Well, we use a process um, known uh, as a charrette. Um, and a charrette is an intensive workshop process. Um, uh, the term comes from usage in America, but uh, it's known by other names around the world, inquiry by design, design by inquiry indeed. Or, 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 or community workshop, collaborative um, design, co-design. And it typically works like this. We start with what we call expert briefings. And in, in terms of experts, we don't only mean people with sort of recognized technical qualifications, but people who are expert in the place and the location and how people live. Um, we then work together to develop ideas and generate ideas. And then we invite the experts back to critique our initial ideas. We then work together to develop those ideas and then finally present them at the end of the summer school, um, inviting back our, our initial expert uh, briefs to, um, to review our results and, and comment and, and, and uh, adjudicate on them. Um, we will be nominating some key sites in Venice, which you can investigate, or you can bring your own site. You may have a, a part of a city which you are very keen to investigate, um, or you can um, come along uh, and we'll point you in the direction of a, a problem we think needs solving in Venice. And certainly when we talk about Venice, as Alan has said, we see so many of the problems of, of the, of the cities of the world represented there, starting with the shrinking city. While we have a problem of overdevelopment of cities and, and overgrowth perhaps, or, or continued intensive development in some cities in the world, 
in very many cities in the world, the smaller cities, we have an aging population, a declining population. We have built assets going to waste and uh, being ruined and sort of being left behind, forgotten, elderly people are isolated, remote from services. And that's a kind of microcosm of what's happening in Venice, really, under the impact of tourism. And it, in a way, it, it's sort of loss of um, centrality as a, as a place um, uh, uh, in the last 200 years. We have global sea level rise uh, uh, as represented so poignantly in, in Venice since the 1960s when the, the first um, major flood occurred. And it's taken 65 years to achieve a, even a partial solution to that problem. We have the problem of, of conservation and regeneration uh, in a place where uh, everywhere you look is, is a historic monument listed monument. And the problem of tourism and what we might call over tourism, where, uh, because we simply don't build new Venices, as one of my friends once said, we need more Venices because the Venice that we have is oversubscribed. Why aren't we building more places as, as attractive and appealing and, and, and charismatic as Venice? I don't know, I, and I hope that we can solve that problem together. So that's probably enough from me, I think. Um, and I think uh, probably, Alan, if we open up the floor to questions. Um, although, uh, uh, first, I want to invite um, David to talk about some of the practical um, uh, uh, issues around the, um, the summer school. Thank you. Over to you, David. Thanks. No, I'll be very brief, Matthew. So I think what we're looking at in terms of uh, we're trying to do, we're looking at some of the, all the issues we're bringing to the Sustainable Urban Development Programme in Oxford. We're, we're then using uh, Venice as a case study. And Venice is a city of problems and solutions. So the aim of the, the summer studio is to say, what can we learn from the past that's relevant for the present and the future? Uh, so, you know, Venice is a city of contrasts. Um, the, it's a, a major global tourist destination. Uh, the average stay of a, tour, of a visitor in, in, in Venice is, is one and a half days, but the vast majority are there for a few hours. Uh, it's a dense, uh, in some ways, it's a very dense city, as, as Alan mentioned. It's three square miles, there are 182 canals, 435 bridges. And yet this city is facing a depopulation of over one and a half thousand people per year. So there are a lot of dilemmas, if you will, in Venice. There are a lot of issues that you think that Venice is a unique city and it is in many ways. And that's why it will make uh, the summer studio interesting and exciting. But there are many issues in Venice that are, 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 are global issues. So what we're aiming to do, we're looking at the four themes that Matthew mentioned, the active travel, food and urbanism, morphology, the form of cities, and also looking at the, the move towards net zero. What can we learn from Venice's past and present that can be applied to the future, not only for Venice, but also out with to, to your, your hometown, your, your city, your village, et cetera. So I think as a student, what you, you're going to get from uh, the two weeks, well, it's gonna be teamwork. There's also independent study. One of the key things we're trying to, to develop is that the notion of you have an original idea, you can develop it through in your project, You'll have support from the tutors on the course, and you will, at the end of the, end of the two weeks, uh, have your portfolio based around the idea of healthy cities. So how can you link uh, urban design, urban development with, you know, the, the beneficial social fabric of, of healthy urban living? So that is really what we're aiming for, and we're aiming for a good mix of intellectual endeavour, hopefully enjoyable as well. Um, various social activities during the week. So we want that mix, uh, learning and enjoying over the two weeks. Um, and uh, we're very glad to open up to questions. So I'll pass over to Alan, uh, who uh, I think is now going to be the back to being the MC for the, for the session. Not the MC, but uh, if we open up the chat to everyone now, and uh, if you'd like to ask questions, I'll try and direct them to the right person. If there are questions outstanding at the end that we can't get to, then we'll get back to you later by email. So over to you, uh, participants. If you'd like to open up the, the, the questions in the chat, please do. Let's, uh, let's see what, what comes in. Maybe there are no questions. 
but I should say I, I also speak more slowly. Sorry about that. I was getting very excited, so I, 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 I will um I will take on board Catcher's request. So apologies if I was rapid, talking too rapidly. But do ask any questions that um that you have. Ah okay. Uh, how many students will you be accepting? Um, there isn't a definite number. I think it's Reed, um, but we would like we would like to have a group of uh, 25, 30, 30 students around around that number is the number that we're aiming for. But we haven't actually got a cut off. Um, if the course is really popular, we might have to think about that. But uh, it should be a good group and uh, there will be some activities that we can split, I think. Uh, so around 25, 30 students. Can I also add, Alan, that I think it's quite important you know, that it is, we're quite keen on one-to-one -one tuition, uh, working with the tutors. So when you have project design, uh, you know, the, the tutors are going to be with you throughout the week. So it's not the case of you turn up and there's 400 people in the room. So actually, I think this is, a, you know, the, the optimum size for, for these type of studios tends to be 25 to 30. Um, but obviously, if, if, more, if more apply, then we'll, we'll look for solutions for that. Okay, one of the questions that's come in is, okay, brilliant. Can we start... Uh... When can we start submitting our applications? Well, the, the 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 application process is open, so I'll put uh, I'll, I'll put a, a link into the chat for direct link to the to the application process, mm -hmm. and uh, the email mentioned an early bird discount. Can you can you add more details? Yes, I can. The the everybody who's registered for the for the webinar. There are lots of people who registered that can't actually attend today, but everybody who's registered will get an invitation to see the video recording of the of the uh, webinar, and uh, they will receive a promo code in that email, which allows uh, a, an early bird discount of ten percent on the on the on the course fees. Oh, there's a long one here. Perhaps this this is from Yuna. Perhaps Matthew, you would like to take that one. Uh, yeah, exploring. Uh, yeah. Happy to um, Yuna, and um, uh, for those who can't see chat, Yuna writes. I'm a doctoral researcher exploring policy making underlying decision making based on urban foresight project of city government. Firstly, I want to ask whether it is okay. Whether it is okay with not architect background. Secondly, do you think we can expect to learn how Venice city government predicts the future challenges, including the methods tools. So firstly, I would like to reassure everyone here that, um, and in my experience of teaching summer schools, uh, really uh, and background doesn't matter. So uh, don't worry if you're not an architect uh, or, or if you have a, a, a PhD, I think um, everybody, uh, as I said, Brings their own skills and contributes to the to the general um, uh, learning process. Um, and my experience of, of summer schools is that a, a range of backgrounds makes it a much better experience for everyone. And you know, be absolutely delighted to have someone with a PhD um, I, I, I'm looking at um, um, policy making, under, underlying decision making based on urban foresight. This is a, a, you know a hugely important. Um, area in in um, predicting the future of cities and understanding how those decisions are made is, is something that I think would really uh, in, enrich the, um, the the whole studio environment. As for the specific contact with the Venice city government, perhaps Alan, you might be able to answer that better. Um, that's something we can we can look at. Actually, we haven't uh, completely finalized the, the schedule yet. Uh, we do have contacts within uh, the city councils, and it may be something that we could bring in as a, a visiting lecturer or a short, a short visiting lecture about how people see the future of Venice. In fact, it, it's it's a very good suggestion and a very good addition to the course. Thank you, Yuna. That's that's great. 
And can I also, and then we also keep, we have local um, architects, lecturers, etc. So, you know, it's quite important that those uh, teaching on the course also have local knowledge and, uh, and live locally. So um, I'm sure if you want to know about the local uh, governance issues in Venice, then that's very much a topic of conversation that will be coming through in the classes. There's a question, perhaps you could answer that one, David. What do you expect to be in the in the portfolio when the students apply for the course? Well, in terms of we are just interested in um, your reason, why would you want to come to Venice and, and join? So we, we, a letter of interest is really inter is, is important. Um, just your, your CV, your background, we're not really... Um, we, we, as again, we're open to uh, whether you're at postdoctoral level, PhD level, or, or just very engaged in urbanism. And I can I can say this from a, a separate program from in Oxford. We work a lot uh, with um, lifelong learners. And in terms of um, admissions, yes, we we want people who are able to have some some ac academic background, but yes and also some maybe some professional experience but realistically it's just a, an interest in sustainable urban development i mean that interest is going to drive the two weeks and matthew is very clear that you know and and we've run um teaching weeks together many times and actually the best teaching weeks when you have that mixture uh from multidisciplinary backgrounds different age ranges different personal and professional experiences and that mix is uh really important so uh, I guess that's you know just a, a general interest uh, and willingness really to engage in a, in, a, in a what will be a hopefully a busy but enjoyable week uh, uh, or two weeks sorry in, in Venice to consider the idea of healthy cities. Um, that's the main issue. That's the main sort of thing we'd look for in the portfolio. Well, the question in terms of timelines: When can we expect to hear back about the acceptance to our course? We would we would try and get back to you within five working days. So that's very, very straightforward under normal circumstances. We, we'll try and get back with him. If there's a holiday, then it might be a little bit longer, but five working days. Great. We got thanks. Got thanks because I explore Venice and splendid. Looking forward to it. Well, that's great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, think I, I, I think if I could just summarize uh, uh, what, uh, what we look for in a portfolio is you know, presumably we get a, a CV and a, a covering letter, but the portfolio really kind of fills that out and gives us a better idea of, of what you bring to the course as, as a participant. As I said, everyone in the summer school is a participant. Um, it's less teacher and pupil than, than sort of uh, participants informing each other. So you know, it just helps us um, to get to understand where you're coming from. So thank you. Great. Thank you, uh, Matthew. Thank you, David. I think we're going to leave it there. Uh, everyone has my email. So uh, if there are further questions, just don't hesitate. Please, uh, please email. And uh, thank you very much for participating. I'll let you sign yourselves out of the webinar. And uh, yeah, thanks again. It's great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, thanks, everyone. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in Venice.